Hi class, so today I want to talk about the rise of big data and what's called the quantified self. Uh, when we're thinking about what the documented life means, increasingly, especially with our mobile technologies, it means gathering a massive amount of data about ourselves to tell us about who we are. Uh, and this was seen in Gary Wolf's TED Talk a bit. He talked about all the data he was able to collect about himself in a single day and what that said about who he was. Um, and beyond things like stepping on a scale to tell us how much we weigh, what we're doing is gathering an array of data um, to understand our lives. And to have this big data, this massive amount of data, give us insights about who we are in ways that weren't previously accessible is the idea. From things like journals for taking care of kids on a simple level, uh, I have a friend, for example, who had twin boys, and to be able to just take care of them on a day-to-day -day basis was an enormous task that was then delegated to technologies like mobile devices to help regulate every little detail of their lives. Uh, to things like your finances, to things like exercise, to sleep, and to healthcare. And essentially it's affecting a wide range of areas of life, the ability to gather a lot of data and analyze that data. And doing so, in essence, as a mirror to understanding who you are a little bit better, uh, getting at the quantified self. Not necessarily the qualitative self, the person you know who you are, that you like certain forms of music, that you like uh, certain art styles, but instead tapping into the quantitative side of things. Things like Last FM that allow you to monitor every single music track you've ever listened to for you to say, you know, you like, you say you like a particular band, but if you look at your statistics, actually you like this popular band much better. Uh, based on the quantified self, the big data of your music listening sh reveals this about who you are. So, in essence, um, as Gary Wolf ends his talk, he says, if we want to act more effectively in the world, we have to get to know ourselves better. And the way then ultimately he's arguing to get to know ourselves better in this day and age is the quantified self, is collecting a massive amount of data about your everyday life to tell you uh, who you are. And this is in an era of big data in uh, what many are calling the era of information that is too big to know. That when it comes to the human sensorium, what you're able to detect and understand as knowledge, as fact, through your human body is very limited. Instead, through the gathering and analysis of massive amounts of data, we now understand things that we never knew possible. Um, that in essence, by tracking uh, the human genome, uh, digging into the DNA of humankind as we know it, which is a massive amount of data, just an enormous amount of data to collect and to sift through, we are understanding the core code of what it means to be human in a way that wasn't accessible prior to being able to do the computational analytics of that much data. Uh, and then we have things like the tracking of data by the NSA, of all the data that's being gathered over telephone lines and on the internet, to then sift through that and find patterns that they will then detect as terrorist activity, as one example. Uh, so you have the collection of a massive amount of data to then sift through that data looking for specific patterns. Uh, and having access to that data allows them to gather things that were are too big to know on a human scale. They have to be computated. They have to fall under computation, computational analysis to be really understood. So let me put this in perspective about how much data we are producing in this era of the documented life, how much documentation is happening now. So on the internet every day, there are 1,826 petabytes of information that are produced. Uh, the NSA intercepts about 1.6% of that, which is 29 petabytes. So what is a petabyte? Um, again, when we're talking about 1,800 petabytes or so that we are producing daily, that number or that word doesn't necessarily mean all that much until you put it in, in perspective. So if you think about it, 
the lowest order of size uh, for computation is a bit. It's the smallest unit that a computer uses. Uh, it's a binary, a zero or a one. Again, we're a digital society, it's those digits. It's a zero or a one, and it is that smallest unit of data. It's a binary, a zero or a one is a bit. A byte is eight bits, and that's equal to one typed character in Microsoft uh, Office, for example, in Microsoft Word. A kilobyte is sort of the equivalent of a short story, that much, that many letters spelled out. That's how much data in it is in a kilobyte. And a megabyte is one million bytes, and that's about the size of a novel or so. The very first hard drive that existed was the IBM 350. This contained 500 megabytes of space, and it was massive. Uh, 500 megabytes. Most of us are carrying USB drives that are between 8 and 16 gigabytes, uh, and this was 5 megabytes. Uh, and it's uh, essentially about uh, a megabyte in, is about the number of characters that are in a novel. A uh, gigabyte, then, in comparison, if you think of it, again about a byte being about one typed character, one gigabyte is the characters in 30 books that are stacked side to side. Or it might be the equivalent of 200 MP3s that are playing simultaneously uh, five minutes each, uh, five minutes each in length, or playing in length. So that's a gigabyte. A terabyte, which is a trillion bytes, is roughly the equivalent of a human being's functional memory. Uh, and Raymond Kurzweil, who's this futurist, has argued that the human mem functional memory is about 1.25 terabytes and Scientific American estimates it closer to 2.5 petabytes but some are arguing in essence that a terabyte about one terabyte is the equivalent data of your functional memory as an individual and a petabyte which is this huge number of bytes uh, is the equivalent functional memories of about 800 people that's one petabyte. So in essence, um, a petabyte is also about, um, in terms of MP3s, a petabyte of songs would last over 2,000 years playing continuously. And I think that's about average of four minutes per song. So if you add one petabyte, one petabyte of music, if you listen to them back to back, about four minutes a piece, that would be 2,000 years of continuous playing. If you counted every bit in a petabyte, again, either the ones and the zeros, if you counted every one of them at one per second, it would take you 285 million years to count the bits in a petabyte. Uh, in terms of DVDs, if you stacked DVDs, uh, the number of DVDs it would, it would take to equal a petabyte of information, the DVD stack would reach um, over a mile into the sky. In essence, what they are, what the Large Hadron Collider is producing at CERN when they're colliding all these atoms, looking for um, the God particle, what they're producing is 15 petabytes of data a year, and Facebook is storing 180 petabytes each year, and we are producing again 1,826 of these every single day. The amount of videos that we're producing. Um, in 2012, there are 200 petabytes of video played on Vimeo, um, which is uh, less than what's produced even on YouTube. So what comes after petabytes? There's zettabytes, uh, and then there's yottabytes. And it's argued that the entire observable universe is 880 yotta meters. So if there's a multiple greater than a yotta, what comes after this, and we're already talking about that in terms of data, then the entire observable universe would fit into one of them. And we're already talking about a Yoda byte. This is how massive we're talking when it comes to the production of data. So this is way beyond the human sensory capacity for understanding. The amount of data we're producing every single day globally is so far beyond anything that, that our human bodies can comprehend that ultimately it's changing what it means to know something. So we are producing massive amounts of data so far beyond anything that we can actually comprehend in an embodied way. 
It's just something I don't understand. I can't even begin to grasp the amount of data that we are producing every single day around the world. And what this massive amount of data is doing is changing what facts mean. It's changing what we actually know as humans because it's not something that the human body through observation can detect, through empirical looking. Instead, it's about taking data, putting it through a computer, analyzing it, and having that analysis, analysis tell us something. It's changing what we know. Uh, this is the era of big data. So when it comes to the documented life, Think about how much data we are all producing on a daily basis. All the stuff we're putting online for others to observe, all of the data that's part of our documented life is a part of this massive ecology of data out there that is now being sifted through and is telling us about what it means to be human in a different way than we understood. And we are producing a small little drop in this bucket of massive data. Um, and again, what Gary Wolf is arguing is that to really understand yourself now in the era of big data, you have to understand what it means to be human through analysis of this data. Uh, so Jennifer Whitson is arguing in her article about the gamification of this is that we are engaging this in part because it's very pleasurable to do. What we can know about ourselves through the quantified self movement, through tracking all this data about ourselves, Part of that's pleasurable, and it's also surveillance. And for her, it's surveillance that's pleasurable. Also, it's a, it should be understood that that surveillance means different things in different places. It's one thing to track yourself and to track your data as a mirror um, versus tracking it socially with your friends uh, to track your running using Nike Plus, for example, to, to let others know your data. Uh, and then it's another thing in the workplace to have that data being tracked on your keyboard, to let to have your boss know your location. All of these things mean different things in different locations. Again, from the last lecture, space is not this empty container that you just enter. It's something you produce and make meaningful through practice. And each space is different when it comes to the quantified self. It means different things to monitor data, this massive amount of data, in different settings. Uh, and it must be understood uh, as such. And so beyond the control of the body, you know, this idea of the discipline of the body, of the self, that the quantified self movement is doing, it's also the control of knowledge, what we do know. Uh, it tells us what we know. It's shifting how you know. And then lastly, it's worth contrasting big data with deep data. It's important to understand that big data leaves out certain things. It leaves out the qualitative, the qualitative data aspects of small studies, of understanding something on a micro scale rather than a massive scale, to understand that a conversation with a single person about something that's meaningful to them can be absolutely just as profound and just as meaningful, produce as much knowledge as the massive amounts of data that we're producing on a daily basis. Deep data is just as significant as big data. So when we think about significance, scale is not always significance. The size of things, the size of the data that we're producing doesn't necessarily mean it's important. Sometimes a small amount of data is as equally important as the 1,826 petabytes that we're producing on a daily basis. And it's worth keeping that in mind when thinking about these major uh, cultural shifts that are happening often, deep data, cannot be discounted when it comes to human knowledge and, and understanding the things that we can know about the world around us. Have a good weekend ahead.